book of the Psalms. And so this we're going to follow until the end of the calendar year. And then we will, um, in January, our, our study for January 2023, and on into 2023 is going to be in the book of Esther. But we are looking right now into the fourth book of Psalms. And what we're going to see, hopefully today, is how not only what these individual Psalms say, but how they connect together for a theme that runs throughout this book of the Psalms. I want to read the Psalm and then we'll pray and then we'll, we'll jump into it here. So in Psalm 92, it says, uh, the superscription says, a Psalm, a song for the Sabbath. It is good to give thanks to the Lord to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp and the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord, your thoughts are very deep. The stupid man cannot know, the fool cannot understand this, that though the wicked sprout like grass and all evildoers flourish, they are doomed to destruction forever. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies shall perish. All evildoers shall be scattered. But you, have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. You've poured over me fresh oil. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies. My ears have heard the doom of my assailants. The righteous flourish like a palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age and are ever full of sap and green, to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful to gather together to give praise to the Lord. We're thankful for the opportunity to open your word. And Lord, in these gatherings, you've been pleased to guide and direct us to understand your word, that we might apply it in our hearts and that our walk may be instructed thereby. Lord, we pray that you will be honored in our time this morning in your word, and we give thanks to you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. The psalm is divided in three parts, and I have made some last-minute changes to the outline that I've given you, and so you'll see this. The PowerPoint is, I think, correct. I tried to make some changes and corrections on it, um, but um, and that's because I, in working on these things, I'll work on this all week, and it seems that it, it goes in a certain way, and then all of a sudden, I may see it a little bit differently, and the way in which I believe that the psalm is structured differs a bit from the way in which the paragraphs are grouped in the English Standard Version, which I have put and used as the text uh, here. So the first section really is verses one to three, and verse four goes with the next section, which runs down to verse 11. And then verses 12 to 15 is the last section. So there's basically three sections of the psalm. The psalm begins a psalm, a, a song for the Sabbath. And I want to hold reflection on that until the end. You know, it's typical when we read these psalms, we don't think much about those superscriptions. Um, they're actually part of the text. Uh, it's not, that's not just an editorial. Now, some of your translations, you'll see translators will put, that kind of summarize the meaning, for example, in this English Standard Version, before Psalm 92, it says, how great are your works. That line in there in the text 
did not come from the text. That was the translator put that in there. Okay. And so, and you know that you see that in your translations that your translator, uh, your translations will kind of summarize portions that kind of give a heading, a, a little subheading there and this sort of thing. But in, but the so, superscription of the Psalm that says there, a Psalm, a song of the Sabbath, that actually is in the biblical text. So you'll see some Psalms that have a superscription, a Psalm of David that actually is in the text. Now, when we read it, we, we tend to treat it um, as if it's not, and we get on to what, where we like to start, which is the next line. But that superscription is interesting. We don't always understand why they're there or, or what they actually mean. There's been a debate through the history of the church about some of these things and some of the interpretations of them are, are a little odd, but um, I remember one of them. Uh, I was doing work <clears throat> on the Psalms years ago. We were gathering materials uh, for a publication that has been published, um, gathering comments from early uh, Christian commentators. And there was a Psalm <clears throat> that uh, had a superscription that read to Jeduthun. And Jeduthun, actually, the name comes up in Chronicles, um, you know, as to, to who that, that guy is. But I was uh, reading Augustine's um, comments on, on that psalm, and at that time, he didn't know who Jeduthun was. <laughs> And he was trying to exegete the meaning of the name. And he came up with the idea that the, the word from which the name came meant to leap. And then he used that as a preacher to talk about leaping through the psalm. <laughs> and I, Let's leap over here and see what the, it is really interesting rhetorically, but it had nothing to do with the actual meaning of the, of the verse. So sometimes these superscriptions are not well understood. <clears throat> this one is interesting, but we're going to leave it to the end. That's why it's at the end of your outline. Okay? So <clears throat> we're going to start our study here in verse 1. It is good to give thanks to the Lord to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night to the music of the lute and the harp and the melody of the lyre. So these three verses here, <clears throat> what's interesting about this psalm is that um, this and then portions of the next section, the point is in the middle of a kind of chiastic structure. So you have verse one and verse three are making a point. If you read them together, it's good to give thanks to the Lord, sing praises to your name. Look at verse three, to the music of the lute and the harp and the melody of the lyre. But in the middle, the middle verse is the point. And that is to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. Verse verse here about it, the fact that it is good to do that. You know, it seems that over these past six years, things have been so strange, uh, and it's always strange in the country when you're thinking about news and politics and all that kind of thing. But I find I found myself, uh, you know, I get up in the morning, and the first thing I'm doing is I'm checking my phone for the latest news, okay? Have, have you know, are we in a nuclear war, you know, today? I mean, did that happen overnight? You know, it just so you don't want to know where, where are we? <clears throat> and after a while, you know, you do that and you think, you know, this is really not the best way to start the day. <laughs> Psalm says it's good to give thanks to the Lord to declare his steadfast love in the morning. It's good for several reasons. Number one, it's good for me. It's good for you. It's good for our minds. It's good for our hearts. That's the way we start the day. And you know that one of the basic disciplines of the Christian life is to have a, a time with the Lord in the morning. 
it's good to do that. It's not just that we ought to do that, but it's actually good. There's a benefit to the one who, who begins the day by declaring the steadfast love of the Lord, putting your mind and heart there. It's not only good for, for each of us individually, but it's good for us and our relations with other people. Uh, you know, in your home, with your spouse, with the people you're going to go and work with, the people that you interact with through the day, if you have been set in orientation to God for that day, and your mind and heart are right with the Lord in that day, that flows over to the people then who who encounter you and whom you encounter in the rest of that day. It's good. <clears throat> it's good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to his name. Giving thanks and singing praises go together. Praising God, by the way, is not just saying praise the Lord. Saying praise the Lord is an admonition. But to but to, to say his praises, to actually praise him, is to speak about him, is to meditate on his attributes. What is God like? Is to meditate on his works. What has he done? What is he doing? What are the works of the Lord? What is the, what are the attributes of God? Uh, what is the scripture saying about the Lord? And to declare that and to speak of that to speak of that with respect to what he's done for me, how he has shown his power to me. To speak of that is to praise God. And going right along with the praise is thanksgiving, thankfulness to him. So you begin your day that way. Notice that this is done with uh, music, music of the lute, the harp, the melody of the lyre in verse three. There's three instruments there. There's some dispute about the proper meaning and understanding of them. Let's see if I have that. I don't have that right here. But anyway, uh, the, 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 the picture here is of these instruments. I had that on the first slide. There, there they are. So there is an artist's representation of a lute and a lyre. <clears throat> a lyre looks kind of like a harp. It's not exactly a harp, but they're stringed instruments. There's some question about whether the lute is really a lute that looks like a guitar, doesn't it? <clears throat> and uh, that also is a stringed instrument. But um, some feel that the words here are referring to different kinds of lutes. They're, you know, just as an orchestra today, you've got, you take the guitar, for example, you got a guitar you can strum, you, you got a smaller version you can put on your shoulder and play like a violin, or you can do a viola, or you can do a bass. Well, you know, there's all kinds of versions of this. And apparently the lyre, there were different versions of this too. They make different sounds depending on the thickness of the string and the, the wood that was used and so on. So all three, <clears throat> the three words in verse three are indicating that you've got all three of these working together, and they seem to indicate an orchestra. Uh, and this would have been true in the temple. So you have an orchestra of strings. This is a very ancient orchestra <laughs> of stringed instruments. And uh, they would, you know, just like orchestras today, where some instrument might play the alt melody and others are playing, you know, in relationship to it, it all comes together in a beautiful sound. How does that apply to me early in the morning? Well, I can't get the orchestra, but I can put on the music, can I? And, you know, Christian music, um, there is music that's worshipful, that you know, and you and many of you find that in your quiet time, that one of the things you might do is, is uh, listen to Christian music, sing along with it, sing praise to the Lord. Use that as a time to prepare your mind to meditate on the word of God, to read the scripture. And maybe the scriptures that you read 
and giving praise to the Lord would come from book four of the Psalms. Because many of these Psalms are classics of giving praise to the Lord, the Lord who reigns. Well, the psalmist says that it's good to give thanksgiving and praise to the Lord. And what do you do? Verse two, to declare the steadfast love of the Lord in the morning, and faithfulness by night. Note the morning and night. I think it's interesting to declare the steadfast love in the morning. So when the, when the day awakes, you awaken to the love of the Lord. And then at night, when the day is done, what are you declaring? That he's been faithful through the whole the day. Declare his love in the morning and his faithfulness at night. Notice also how this connects <clears throat> with our book four, because back in Psalm 90, remember Psalm 90, the Psalm of Moses, where so much of the middle of that Psalm is a remember, uh, is a call for us to number our days because God turns man back to dust. And we think about the, the wrath of God and because we're sinners. And so we, we learn to number our days. But that's not where the psalm ends. Because after saying, uh, teach us, in Psalm 90, verse 12, teach us the number of our days and we may get a heart of wisdom, then Moses tells us that what we need to do is to appeal to him. Given this is our situation, appeal to him. For his love and mercy. So he says, return, O Lord, have pity on your servants. Verse 14, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. That's what Psalm 92 picks up on. So in Psalm 92, it's good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to the name, to declare your steadfast love in the morning, which is the thing that you're asking for from him in light of the fact that he's our creator and has given us only a limited number of days. But we, rather than being depressed at that, take what Psalm 91 says, refuge in him and dwell in him, and then give thanks to him with a steadfast love that he gives to us, even in the limited number of our days. By the way, Psalm 91 reminded us that when you dwell in him, you're dwelling in the everlasting one. And there are promises in there that the rest of the scripture develops. So, <clears throat> Also, Psalm 91 gave the promises at the end of the psalm. It says, Psalm 91, 14, because he, that's the one who trusts in the Lord, holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him. He knows my name. He call, When he calls me, I will answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I'll rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And this is true even of the God who told us to number our days. But he made a promise, with long life, I will satisfy him. Because he dwells in me, the Lord says. Now, it's because of that that when we awake in the morning, to yet another numbered day, we give thanks for the steadfast love of the Lord. And then all the way to the night with gratefulness for his faithfulness to us. That's what this Psalm says. And we're doing this with joy. Starting in verse four, verse four starts with a four. You see that? <clears throat> for you, O Lord. So <clears throat> this is the reason for giving the praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. For you have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. 
This whole section here is distinguished by uh, I and you pronouns. Uh, the psalm is not talking about me, I, and you, the Lord. And this runs from verse 4 all the way through verse 11. So the greatness of the Lord's work. Um, in Psalm 90, verse 16, it says, let your work be shown to your servants. This was Moses who taught, told us we need to number our days and so on, but we need to appeal to the Lord for a steadfast love. And then Moses asked the Lord, let your work be shown to your servants. Now, Psalm 91, the next psalm, which was all last week, in verses 3 through 16, that's the major section of the psalm, talked about a work which the Lord showed to the psalmist. And that work was, he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and you will find refuge under his wings. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day, the pestilence, the stalks, and the darkness, and so on, because you made the Lord your dwelling place. That's the work that he shows to me. And so <clears throat> in Psalm 92, he says, for you have made me glad by your work. It's by this care, by this protective care that God works into my life, the psalmist says, that God makes me glad even though I have a limited number of days, according to Psalm 9. God <clears throat> makes me glad. And at the works of your hands, I will sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord? Your thoughts are very deep. You know, <clears throat> our study of Job brought Job to this point where uh, the Lord answered him in Job 38 to uh, 42, where, where uh, God answered Job. Job's desire to know what, how to understand what was happening to him. And what the Lord showed Job were his works. All kinds of, all aspects, dimensions of his works from the beginning of creation to the various creatures that populate this universe that God has made. And the question of Job was, do you understand this? And the answer is, no, I don't. And the point here, his works are great and his thoughts are very deep and we don't really understand how the providence is working. We don't even know all the creatures that are involved in this but he works them all to his glory. Your thoughts are very deep. Isaiah 55, 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord. Romans 11, Paul says, uh, talks about his, the inscrutable ways of God. Um, beyond our comprehension and our understanding. So when it comes to how God is caring for us, we don't really know how he does it, but the point is that he does. Verse six, though God's thoughts are very deep, the stupid man, the word that's translated there, the stupid man actually means beast, the beastly man, that is, he's stupid like a beast, like an animal, just no comprendo, okay, he just cannot understand, he cannot know, he, the fool cannot understand this, and what is it that they can't understand, verse 7, though the wicked sprout like grass, and all evildoers flourish, they are doomed to destruction forever. Sprout like grass, all the evildoers flourish. 
but are doomed to destruction forever. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, behold, your enemies shall perish and all evildoers shall be scattered. So <clears throat> verses four through six, the central part, verse five, is the key. Your, how great are your works, your thoughts are very deep. Verses seven through nine, the central verse is verse eight. That's the key. But you, O oh Lord, are on high forever. What the, the fool cannot understand, <clears throat> the central point he can't understand is that the Lord is the most high, which Psalm 91 uh, emphasized, the most high. God is on high forever. He can't understand that, and he can't understand that though the wicked sprout like the grass and they seem to flourish, they are doomed to destruction forever. Note the word forever at the end of verse 7 and the word forever at the end of verse 8. They are in parallel. Just as God is on high forever, so the, so the wicked evil is doomed to destruction forever. It will forever be gone. And that's the point at the end end of the Bible, at the end of the story. And it's the point about the everlasting nature of hell, which has as its primary purpose, Jesus says, is the destruction of Satan and his angels, but of all the wicked as well. In the plan and purpose of God, they are gone. Like Psalm 1, righteous flourish like a tree, but the wicked are like chaff, which the wind blows away. They're not there anymore. That is the thing that they don't get and they don't grasp. In the whole issue with Job, the friends, so-called friends, kept pointing this out. Look, Job, it's very clear. Look, the wicked are condemned and punished by God. The righteous are blessed. We've got that. You are being punished, obviously, so you obviously are wicked. And Job says, oh yeah, well, what about people who are obviously wicked who are not being punished? What about that? And Job throws at it a couple of times and they keep coming back. Job, you're not getting it. The wicked are punished and the righteous are blessed. You're being, you know, and all this kind of thing. And Job at the end says, look, I understand that the wicked are punished. I understand that. But I'm suffering here, okay? So when it comes to the end, God says, look, do you understand what's going on here? You don't, totally. But Job's experience proves the point. The righteous are blessed. And what happened? Well, the wicked seem to flourish for a while. The Chaldeans are carrying off his livestock. There they are. Sabaeans are carrying off his camels. They seem to be doing just fine. But after a while, they're not because it was a quick flourishing. So this summer when we're having a drought, <clears throat> we have a park close by and we walk the dog out there. And it's really interesting because during the summer, you know, that green grass began to shrivel in the park. And then it turned brown and then bronze and then turned to dust. You know, so it, it's really interesting to watch the progress of that. And then we'd get that occasional rain. And the next week it was green. <laughs> you know? Now, St. Augustine takes a little time to come back, but this stuff that grows in the park, you know, it's green again. And then, you know, gradually fades. And He's saying that the wicked are like that sprout up very, they seem to flourish, they just seem, but they don't understand that it's not lasting. Which was the point of Ed Lutzer's sermon last week on Psalm 73, uh, where the psalmist said, you know, I almost slipped when I look at the prosperity of the wicked. But then I went in the temple and I understood what their end was. <clears throat> the Bible teaches the believer to have an eschatological perspective. That is a perspective that's focused on the future, the, the culmination of things. <clears throat> and, that's, and that's because 
that's where Paul says, Galatians, that's where your life is. That's, that's where we're going. We're headed there. And that reality is everlasting, everlasting. <clears throat> and in that resurrection from the dead, and in that renewal of all things, the power and the majesty and the glory of God, the creator and redeemer, it all comes together for a life that we are given by the Lord with him forever. And Job's experience at the end of his life where his, his time of suffering comes to an end and God restores everything to him, double, and, and extends his life. And all of this is a, is a sign, it's a, it's a, it's a type of, of something that's not just up to 140 years, but is forever. Well, <clears throat> that's because God is there. Verse 9, behold your enemies, O Lord, for behold your enemies. That's That repetition underscores this. The wicked of verse 7, all evildoers, are actually enemies of God. And your enemies, O Lord, will perish because no one can stand against God. All evildoers, verse 9, shall be scattered. Not just perish, but scattered. That takes you back again to Psalm 1, like the dust blown away, just scattered away. They're not there. Verses 10 and 11 are, are really within this section. There's not a third point on the outline, and I have third point. You can scratch out that Roman numeral three on the outline. Because the refreshing freedom and joy is part of the greatness of God's work. What has he done for me? He says, but you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. That's an interesting metaphor. We don't typically use that metaphor today, but you see it a lot in the Psalms. The, the, the metaphor of exalting the horns like an, an, uh, an, a horned animal or animal with antlers. And so when they lift their head and those horns are up there, that's a sign of dignity, a sign of strength. God has restored me. That's what that point is. The exalt, exalt the horn is to lift the head. It's to, be, it's to be strengthened and granted the standing of dignity. That's what God has given to me, he says. Interesting that in Job 39, 9 to 12, this was one of the animals that God asked Job about, the wild ox. So Job, you... You understand about the wild donkey? You understand about the wild ox? Look at that wild ox out there. Can you go tame him? Can you hitch him to your plow? Would you use him as a pet for your children? No. You just leave him alone. <laughs> and he just is out there doing his thing you know, with freedom and joy. And that's the point of the psalmist here. He, you know, the, the wicked want to, you know, they want to assail me. They want to capture me. They want to use me. But God has released me with freedom and joy. You've poured over me fresh oil. The oil is an anointing. <clears throat> that's part of a, a, a festive, celebratory moment. Uh, and whereas they perish, whereas they're scattered, he has exalted me and he has refreshed me as if with oil. My eyes, verse 11, have seen the downfall of my enemies. My ears have heard the doom of my evil assailants. Remember Psalm 91? 
the previous psalm, which we looked at last week, and that central section about deliverance, he will deliver you, and so on. And it came down to this line, verse 7, a thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. So the next Psalm, Psalm 93, my eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies. My ears have heard the doom of my evil assailants. See how the Psalms connect together? So here, when you think about this, think about that whole section of Psalm 91 and, and load that into your mind and bring that into this psalm. Okay. You know, Job said in Job 42, I have heard of you, he said to the Lord, but now that I see you, he says, I, 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 I repent. Now that I see you, it, it's one thing to hear about it. <clears throat> it's one thing to know intellectually, but, but when you actually see it, you actually, so here he says, you know, I, I know this truth that wickedness does not prosper, that the wicked do not prosper. I know this truth, but when I see it and see the judgment of God, uh, that, that, That means so much more. It brings it home existentially to me. The next section, which I have as Roman numeral four, the outline is really the third Roman numeral, and that's the flourishing of the righteous. The righteous flourish like a palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Look, you can go up to verse seven and circle, sprout like grass, and the word flourish, and then draw a line down here to verse 12, flourish like the palm tree and grow like the cedar in Lebanon. That's the contrast in the psalm. The wicked sprout like the grass, sprout up real quick, look good for a moment. The righteous are like the palm tree and the cedar. They don't grow real fast, but they grow. <laughs> and they grow. And then and the storms of life may come, hurricane may come on the palm tree, but it keeps growing. It keeps growing. These palms that the Bible's talking about are estimated to, have, to be able to have grown 60 to 70 feet tall and could last over 200 years. The cedars of Lebanon are said to have grown over 120 feet tall. That's a that's the height of a 10-story building with a diameter of nine to ten feet and could last up to 3,000 years. These were magnificent trees. Unlike the wicked sprouting up like the grass, the righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar. Lebanon, and they are planted. Where are they planted? In the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age and are ever full of sap and green. So here they are. These trees are just <laughs> still there and producing fruit. Notice that this is even in old age. Remember Psalm 90? Teach us to number our days. The years of our life, he said in Psalm 90, verse 10, are 70, and even by ring, uh, reason of strength, 80, span of toil and trouble, they're soon gone and we fly away. But, Moses says, we should appeal to him for his steadfast love. And Psalm 91 said, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And God promised at the end of that Psalm, verse 18, with long life, I will satisfy him. In spite of what Psalm 90 said, 
And here in Psalm 92, they bear fruit even in old age. Do you see how the theme is being carried through the Psalms? Yes, we have a limited time because of the, the issue of physical death. But there's something about abiding in God, the everlasting one. And there are promises in him, promises that are given to the one who trusts in him. They may even manifest themselves in long physical life. But what we know in the story of the Bible, that the final manifestation of that blessing of all Abiding in the shelter of the Almighty is the power of resurrection over death. And that power of everlasting life. This is what comes from the Almighty as a gift of his grace because of his steadfast love for which we give thanks. And so, verse 15, we declare the Lord is upright. That he is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Remember when the Lord was answering Job, Job in all of his misery, saying, Wait, he just would answer me. God answers him, okay? He speaks. And the and God says in Job 40, verse 8, Will you even accuse me of wrong to make yourself look right? Will you do that? Job doesn't do that because he knows that he is God wrong. And the psalmist says, there is no unrighteousness in him. And this is a psalmist who's very well aware of Psalm 90. Very well aware that we have a limited number of days. Very well aware that we are a sinful people and that God is holy. And very well aware that there is toil and trouble that comes into life. Very well aware of that, but aware that he who abides in the shelter of the Most High, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, abides in the shadow of the Almighty. And, the, and, and that one, the Almighty, the Most High, is also the Lord, who makes promises to the one who trusts in him, who promises of life and blessing. And when I abide in him and when I take shelter in him, I discover his steadfast love. A steadfast love that goes with the fact that he is forever and wickedness will disappear. It will be blown away. But I find a life from him that satisfies me. A long life but the Bible goes on to speak that's everlasting. What about that superscription, a song for the Sabbath? It seems that this was a psalm that was recited on the Sabbath day, which is the end of the week. So you come through the week, the week of work a week of work, and on the Sabbath day to reflect like this in the goodness of God. But early on, the other Jewish literature, especially what we get from the second to the sixth centuries, um, refer to this psalm that Sabbath is not just the Sabbath of the week, the seventh day, but the eschatological Sabbath. That is the Sabbath at the end of days, at the end of it all. But this is a psalm for then. And that's what we've been referring to often here this morning, that the hope for resurrection life, that there's something from God that overcomes all death and it comes from him. And, and that is everlasting life and resurrection. So it's a song for the Sabbath. And that seems to be correct 
from the standpoint of the New Testament, because Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4 speaks of this. And with this, we'll close here. He says um, in Hebrews 4, he talks about Psalm 95, they shall not enter my rest. There is a rest. And he says, um, verse 9, Hebrews 4, verse 9, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has rested from his works as God did from his. And we seek to enter that rest, that Sabbath rest rest is that eschatological rest that we find in God. This psalm especially speaks to that. And it's in light of that that it's read. Now, we have maybe a minute or two for comments, questions, observations on our song for the Sabbath. Comments, questions, thoughts, observations, reflections. Yes, sir. I had a flashback, making me cry thinking about it. That stepdad's love in the morning, praying the night. Yes. Grandmother, when I stayed with her during the summer, she was sitting there the sink in the morning. Came to the garden alone. Mm -hmm. Do still on the road to walk to me and talk to me. Mm -hmm. me on his own. Mm -hmm. Love who's there. Never clear. Yeah. It's hard to do that sometimes in the morning. You know, get up in the world. Not to be yeah. Challenge, but it's pretty worth it. It is. It is, and that that song the, in the garden is is a wonderful one. Many apply that psalm to the time with the Lord, to the, the personal time that we have with the Lord, is referring to that, and and, uh, and that's absolutely right. It it changes you, it does. Thank you, Joe. Yes, Barbara. This um, verse 10, when he talks about being anointed mm -hmm. with fresh oil, mm -hmm. um, he says again, and he says again. Well, I was thinking of the refilling and refreshing of the Holy Spirit that came to the church in our first book, chapter of Acts, mm -hmm. 31. Mm -hmm. and they prayed, and the they would have already received the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. but he came. And refilled and encouraged them again. And I, I thought too of uh, Zechariah 4 6, not my mind, not like uh, how he would by my spirit. Yeah. So that he's saying, My Holy Spirit will resurrect you, will you will receive the eternity uh, that is promised. Yes, thank you, Barbara. Uh, Barbara's point, Zoomers, is the oil there. Um, and many point out that oil is a is a type of metaphor for the Holy Spirit in some passages of Scripture. The refresh the, the refreshing with oil is like the, the refilling uh, with the Holy Spirit. The Book of Acts talks about you know we're all baptized with the Spirit, but there is this this filling that that happens and happens repeatedly. Uh, being filled with the Spirit, there's a refreshing. Uh, refilling and refreshing of, of the of the power and presence of God with the Holy Spirit. And just as a reminder, uh, you know, connect that with the word, because in, in the scripture, the word and the spirit always go together. And that's why the time in the word and, and the, the attitude of thankfulness and prayer to God is connected with the experience of the refreshing and strengthening of the Holy Spirit. The spirit works with the word. And so there is this, this even the sense of, of power that comes along with the joy. <clears throat> and so, um, yeah, I think that's a good point, uh, Barbara, and in, in connecting these two together. 
and um, and seeing it that way. Yes, Sally Ann. Um, this is always said about number one through four. Always repeated. Verses one through four of, of Psalm 92. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, this is a, a wonderful, a wonderful psalm to remember. And these psalms have application in so many ways. Um, I'm convicted that, that the early church uh, in, the, in the first few centuries, the, the pastors that we know um, had these psalms memorized, all of them. And they would and they would say them. Of course, people who were going into those monastic communities would recite them every week, um, daily recitation. They go through all 150. So it's a it's a thing that you know people have have learned these, and and God has used them uh, once again. The Word of God to to have it in your mind and in your heart. Read it in your time with the Lord. Reading these very songs is an encouragement and a refreshment. Karen? I again like Psalm 55, 17, David prays morning and evening. The evening, morning, and evening. Yeah. yeah. It is indeed. It is indeed. Thank you, Karen. Well, let's pray together as we close today. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the reminder to us of the goodness that it is to give praise and thanks to you. And Lord, we do that. We do that today. Speaking of your steadfast love, there's not one of us that has not experienced the steadfast love of the Lord. And Lord, we declare your faithfulness for you show it over and over and over again. Lord, thank you for your wonderful faithfulness. Thank you for the grace which, by which you sustain us in the Lord Jesus, in whom place our trust and our hope. We give thanks to you in Jesus' name. Amen.